Welcome to the Five Phenomenon Podcast. I am your host, Shane Hazen. Coming up today, guest is mashup editor Louis Plumondon, better known on the internet as Sleepy Skunk. Um, but first up, what did I watch this week? Um, I finished up my, my end of the year stuff. I'm, I got in this conversation yesterday with a friend. Um, he asked me what my top 10 was. And as you'll hear later in the interview, uh, Louis and I... Um, we st- at the very end we talk our t- or he, uh, we talk about his top ten, and uh, in the conversation with my friend, I came to the conclusion that, look, I still do my top tens. I have this ongoing. Uh, I do it yearly as I go uh, on Letterbox. You can find me on Letterbox under Bodamander B O D B O D A M A N D R. But, I'm maybe I'm done comparing and contrasting my top ten, just because. Top tens, is, when you start sharing them with people, it's all about um, having um, this mix between idiosyncratic and uh, and consensus. It's it's more like this is what we agreed on, and oh, here's something you didn't think of, and that's a natural inclination. But what ends up happening is half of the titles I give just piss people off, and you just have this incredulous. Why did you put that on there? Which was the whole point. And you know when I look at top tens. Um, I just tend to look at them to find movies I hadn't seen or ones I, you know, should see and didn't consider even seeing. And so if I go over my list and I tell you things like, um, um, Avengers Endgame is probably, it is really near the top, um, Parasite's in there, obviously, but my number one is the Mike Mills short film, uh, I Am Easy to Find that you can find on YouTube. What's that going to do for you, really? I mean... Are you good? Are you, I mean, I'm t- if I tell you it's a half hour, a little over half hour, are you going to jump out and watch it right away? I hope so. But most of the people I've told so far, I can count on my hand how many times someone's actually gone out and watched it based on my recommendation. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm glad, I'll keep doing it. Um, but there's something that's also so obnoxious and quantitative that, you know, um, Nick Hornby got right in, in High Fidelity, making fun of it. The top five, uh, maybe it's just kind of an arbitrary, stupid distinction. But that being said, go see I Am Easy to Find. So today on the episode is uh, Louis Pumandon, who... Uh, was really, really polite about um, my Midwest bastardization of his Quebec, uh, French Quebec name. Um, he, uh, as we will discuss on the show, um, he's been making mashup trailers, which are just simply my, just every end of the year, there's something to look forward to. There, um, there's really graceful reminder that um, while we're hard on Hollywood movies, that cumulatively they make some really good stuff and um especially when you can pile it there's a lot of i know i one of the things that always depressed me living in la was um you're it's so competitive for limited slots of jobs and livelihood you tend to forget that almost every single person out there is a talented person who loves movies and uh the talent may not be seen uh, right away or in a way that can make other people money. But, um, when you watch a mashup like this, it just reminds you that, um, the movies do, even in the most corporatized, um, profit driven, uh, incentives, there's some real creativity still in the movies. And, uh, Louie in particular is a very talented editor who, um, you know, started this as a hobby, and you could tell there's a clear love behind what he's doing in each of his mashups. So, um, without further ado, here is Louis Pomandon. <laughs> 
So, um, are you crashing right now? From uh, you finished your um, best of decade mashup and uploaded it just last night. So, uh, did you get some sleep? I did. Did you? Uh, yeah. Did you like all night it or uh, go straight through? I just uh, no. I I mean I I try to get sleep because there comes a point where you feel you feel drowsy and you can keep editing, but you just uh, you lose concentration and you're gonna start making mediocre decisions creatively so you're better off with sleep that's the the nature of creative work unlike unlike other types of work is you need sleep otherwise it, it's just not going to be good you can get it done but it won't be good right i always used to refer to it i'm using the term wrong but i used to refer to it as termite art where like when you really get into the weeds on editing you just keep working on the same thing over and over and it becomes micro decision after micro decision that when you step back for a second doesn't make it better oftentimes makes it worse and so like you just can't i push for breaks all the time like i need perspective a lot whenever i'm in the middle of editing it helps yeah, yeah. if you go to bed you wake up the next morning you see like one frame too early one frame too late everywhere hmm. uh, and then you just you start rearranging the order of shots but you didn't see it the night before because you were just um yeah you were too close to it so for sure like you need breaks and you need um you need sleep. There's, there's no way around it. So I guess um, starting out, first question would be, um, wh what? Are, first off, do you are you an editor uh, uh, professionally, or is this just a um, is it, are these mashups a mean to getting your name out as professionally? Uh, yes, I work professionally at a trailer house in LA, but originally I didn't. I used to work in accounting uh, in Toronto, and then eventually I made the move because these mashups got attention. Okay, what trailer house do you work at? Can you say? Uh, sure. I work at Zealot. Okay, I, I, I knew some trailer houses back in the day, but I don't. I am unfamiliar with current LA. What thing? Um, but so, um, how big is your subscriber base? Um, it depends on the country. So if you look on YouTube, there's like a micro base, of maybe like sixteen thousand subs. But if you go on Chinese YouTube, there's about like seven million views and like. Um, a lot larger crowds of people that follow it. So it does get shared ar across a lot of platforms, which earlier in the decade, it didn't. Everybody went to YouTube and this sort of the, was the only place. But then people started just downloading the content from YouTube and putting it elsewhere. So it just gets shared a lot. Was uh, this, is this because uh, what China has like the 12 films they can show rule? And was this a way for people in China to see other films being out there, putting out there? They just have YouTube blocked. The government doesn't allow YouTube in China. So they, they have these different websites and they have these individuals who, I guess they go outside the country or they hack out of the Chinese restrictions and they're able to get content from YouTube and then put it up uh, for people to see. Wow. Um, I guess, um, no, I was, I was asking just because uh, on your uh, 2019 mashup, you said uh, it was going to be on Christmas Eve and... You were a few days late with it, which, as every editor knows, like you just you can never see the end sometimes. And whenever people ask you for estimates of how long something's going to take, it's not like other art forms. You just keep seeing ways it can be better. But putting this out, um, how much pressure do you put on yourself for the delays? Um, I just I had a I had a professor in marketing and business school who said. Something I still quote a lot when I work on editing um, to other people, which is in the moment, people are going to look at how much work you've put in, like how hard, how many hours you've put in and uh, whether you were on time and whether – like they'll look at all these things, but everyone's going to forget about it and no one's going to remember that you were late or how passionate you were or how hard you work. People are only going to remember how good it was. Mm. So that's the only thing you should care about. Because right now, like in the moment, people are like, oh, where is it? But then many months from now, they, the only thing they'll think back was, you know, was this good? It's a bit like uh, movies themselves. Sometimes they're, they're going to push back the release date. Like uh, I know Alita Battle Angel was like pushed back three times yeah. by James Cameron himself. But he was like, yeah, unless it's good, like don't put it in theaters. So just keep working on it until it's good. I know one of my favorite examples of that is the uh, comic book Watchmen back in the day. That was had some inf uh, infamous monthly delays, and that's 
you know, arguably the greatest graphic novel of all time and all those delays led, led to like no one in 87 really cares now about that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a, like, it has to be at a level where I'm comfortable presenting this to people and thinking they're going to be happy with it. So, so, um, getting to the level of how much, um, uh, big question whenever I know how dwarfing is when you see these mashups, um, do you um, do you watch all these movies, or do you are you, are you just watching all the trailers? Yeah, I just watch the trailers. Um, yeah, if I downloaded all the movies, I don't think it would fit on a on a computer hard drive. Well, um, what, but even when I was watching some of these, um, I went through uh, at least all the the mashups, and it feels like one of the cool things is you nail key moments in movies that don't seem like they would be in trailers, like emotional small moments or climactic moments. Um, I mean, are, are you, are, how, how much are you watching movies consistently in general? Uh, like I try to, I try to keep up with what's out there, but I, I, I get an idea of what a movie's like and what it's about. And then eventually sometimes there's going to be a moment in the trailer, but it's just like, it's so compressed that it's not going to really work. And I want the full moment. Um, so then I can always do like a, a, a rip from the Blu-ray of the film but you can only do that for films that have come out, I guess, in the early part of the year because they're available to, for me to purchase and then go get that scene. Right. Uh, but that's that happens maybe like two or three times per mashup. Like when I do these long scenes where there's really like a clip from the film. But most of the, like I'd say 95% of the stuff is from the trailers, especially visually. I, yeah, I guess I was going to go into some uh, technical questions because I know um, some. I, I I knew some mashup trailer editors who use torrents a lot for uh, their stuff. But you're saying um, you mainly use Blu-rays whenever you need to do that, and whatever um, whatever the trailer themselves are being put out with. Yeah, you can you can get a Blu-ray rip and then get a 5.1 audio on it. Um, I mean, if you do it, if you're doing that for everything, then you'd have to purchase every film. Right. Uh, which, you know, it's it's when you really want something and then you're like, you know, they let's say they cobble a line in a trailer and it's not the full line. Um, so like in the decade mashup, there's like a, this speech from the movie About Time. But in the trailer, it's like a, it's a it's a three second version of that. It's very, very compressed. Um, and then there's websites like the Digital Theater uh, and I think it's called Film Universe. Like they're giving you uh, 5.1 versions of their trailers okay. so you lost less splits which is nice because back when we started mashups like me and the other folks doing that on youtube there was no such thing like you had to only use the dialogue that's during the stop down where there's no music that's the only thing you could use so now there's these websites especially digital theater has been great like every big movie every star wars or marvel movie they're going to give you the the six channel audio split so you're able to to isolate that dialogue and then use it. Isolated dialogue was actually the technical question I was going to ask for. So, you, I mean, typically uh, dialogue is going to go into the center channel. Is that where you get it from? Yeah, basically, like, to answer very technically, um, I'll download the 5.1 trailer in MKV. I'll put it through um, Handbrake. Then I'll get a M4V or an MP4. Once I put it in Premiere, then I go into Modify Audio Channels. And then I'm only going to use the first, the top band, and then delete all the other ones. And then that should, sometimes it's not perf perfect, clean dialogue, but it's nice enough that I'm able to use the the audio tweaks and then make it clean. Okay. I guess I noticed more early mashups where uh, people would have to like uh, match up music, or I noticed that on YouTube itself, or um, if, they, if there's not the stems are separated, people have to like either match up the music or what you were talking about earlier, where you would have to... Uh, have a bleed in of the music come into which when a trailer has got to be pretty overbearing another another thing you can do that's kind of funny actually in the decade mashup it happens once is if you don't have it clean you can use whatever is disturbing the audio and make it make sense in your mashup so in this movie demolition with jake gyllenhaal there's this this speech about in the trailer about uh, the human heart is like an automobile um, and you have to put it back together. So that's from the movie Demolition. But there's stuff happening where he's fixing a car, and you can hear those, and yeah. I couldn't get it in. So what I did is I used Toy Story 3 where the horse is in the garbage. Yeah. And he's so that the sound from that is not from Toy Story. It's from 
the quote that's not clean and then I'm just I'm creatively making sense out of the noise that's disturbing the quote. Interesting. Um, another thing I've noticed about um, your mashups in particular, it seems like they're all kind of um, divided into um, if three act. I want to say three act structures, but um, at least three parts. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Like, because um, I mean, you you have di like. Sometimes the section is about, you know, spectacle or joy or CGI stuff or great choreography. Then you'll have your um, drama or your melancholy or your art house. But then there'll be overlaps of joy and grace and some of that stuff. Um, but, I mean, wh where did the um, idea to make, make it three, uh, three parts come into play? It kind of it fell into um, structure just by doing year after year and then... Um, I just thought it was like without going too much into analyzing the why's as to why it work, I feel like it's just enough. Like if you go into four or five, then you can lose people's attention. But then if you only offer one or two, um, then people are left wanting for more. And I think only using one song is making it very difficult to like, you can't really reach into horror and comedy and drama with one music track. Sometimes you can go as far as you can, or you can repurpose the sense of certain movies, but, but it's nice to have three tracks that are allowing you to cover as much territory as you can. Um, so it, it kind of works for me. There's no science to it, but I just feel that if you do a fourth segment, then people are like, oh my God, how long is this thing? But your segments are divided into music tracks. That, that's, your, that's your guardrail through how to get through each of these mashups. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm trying to have as much contrast as possible. So, like when you finish on like Avengers action, like I'm gonna go into, you know, the wind rises and something very like peaceful and like I'm trying to I'm trying to give people different different feels and different beats because otherwise, if you do six minutes of nonstop action after a while, people are like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. I. I I always make these uh, points to people about when it comes to editing that pace isn't just about boring. It's about variety and giving people what they're needing at the moment. So if you've um, gone pretty thoroughly through a uh, fast paced thing there, I mean, there's the concept of rhythm and release. So, you know, if you rhythmically pile on something up, then you want to have a release that lets people off the hook a little and just to relax for a second and contemplate to what's just happened. Um, your music choices, uh, are, are, are you just, are this, is this your music library? Are you compiling your head stuff that you think is going to be cool for trailers or? Uh, well, sometimes it's from a trailer that's been released. So like there's, there's just music. I think in 2017, there was this, this track that was composed, um, by, um, I forgot, I forgot the name. It was an audio machine, but it was, it was one of the companies that does, um, uh, trailer music and, it was for the movie It, and it was for uh, not a trailer, but a TV spot. I thought the song was so good, uh, though, so that's where I got it from. So by watching other people's work in trailers, sometimes they'll they'll choose songs and that I think you know that would make a great track for a mashup. Um, and then otherwise, I just listen to Spotify when I go to the gym, and then eventually I fall on something that plays on shuffle, and I said it it catches my attention and I. I Sometimes you hear songs that ha would marry well with movie moments, and then other music is great, but it doesn't really fit. Um, so I guess it's the same, the same song selection process that music supervisors do. It's more by instinct than by anything else. I mean, how much are movie scores a part of this too? Is that, is that a big part of your Spotify playlists? Um, yeah. I mean, I try to I try to listen to a, a variety of things, and then movie soundtracks is a channel that is going to play quite a bit. Like I think I think in 2018 there was this this song by uh, Sigur Ross in the third segment. Like I I got that on Spotify randomly. I just started playing and then I thought, "Wow, this is this is pretty awesome." Well, Sigur um, Ross is just so so cinematic anyway, yeah. Yeah, they they really are and then that like they they did have hits that were a lot more well known to everyone and then that one song i had never heard before mm. um, but it does make sense sometimes it's an artist that is they're known for doing tracks that, that work well with movies but 
yeah, it's good. It's good when it has lyrics, but also moments with no lyrics. So like the the Mumford and Sons that I used in the decade, there's this whole part where the song itself does not have any lyrics, which is nice because then it allows for me to, you know, not have to use an instrumental and just put in um, like moments, uh, like a long dialogue piece. Well, what's um, what's the uh, struggle whenever you do have to, because I mean, there are moments where you've had lyrics uh, interplay with what you're cutting into there. I mean, is it just in general you avoid it and if you happen to find a ping that where the um, the lyric matches up with the image, you keep it in. But for the most part, you're just trying to get rid of lyrics. Is that the is that the goal, or at least the easiest way to get through it? Yeah, I think I think sometimes it's a constraint because um, you 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 can't use the full song. Um, so you're trying to make a song that's about a minute to two minutes, like the, ideally a 90 second version of the song. But if you if you go into it too slowly, that's not good. If you go into it too fast, so you're trying to repurpose a cut down of that song. And sometimes it comes with lyrics, unless you have the official um, instrumental version, which you know, you'd know you have to ask the copyright owners for the official instrumental, or you can use a karaoke version, which I don't recommend. Um, so that it happens by constraint. A lot of creative decisions are based on constraint. I think I think it fuels creativity that there's so many things you can't do or you can't use, and then you're trying to find wiggle your way through, um, just like uh, trying to write an essay or a screenplay, and then there's all these these words or these ways of expressing that you're not sure about, so you're trying to find another way. It's like okay, this way is blocked, so what do I do instead, or how can I get through that? But ideally, I try not to use dialogue and lyrics together. It it is a bit stuffy, I feel. Um, even if I can quiet it down and really make the dialogue the forefront, I try not to use it, uh, like to, not to do that. So um, you said, or thought I'd seen you say like elsewhere that usually these mashups take about a full month to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been doing them faster than usual because I had to do two in a row. So I, I try to do it more in like two to three weeks, but the tradition has been like from November 1st to the 30th. It's basically like that's that's all that's on my mind, and it's been like that for like all those years. So I'm it's become a tradition. As soon as the, like Halloween is over, I know that the next morning I have to start doing that. Um, I spend a lot of time on the music bed, and I build moments very very early on. So like sometimes there's going to be a moment in the mashup that's really standing out or that's really like well built so that was done like at the very beginning and then i spent the rest of the time just shuffling shots around and then trying to make everything else flow um so that's what i do most of the time at the beginning i'm just doing a sound bit and i'm there's these moments in each mashup that i can say like i did that on day one and it's st it stood there for the entire month um because i knew from the start that that was like this this moment needs to happen at that exact moment like a, like a yeah it's it's the it's the process that makes it good i think it's when you're able to know exactly where it's going and then after that you're trying to get there so are you taking time off for work or are they are seeing this as a marketing tool are they letting you do this from work uh no there wouldn't be time to do that at work <laughs> there's like there's just too much happening but i I start early enough that it's not something that would affect my work, I guess. Um, what I do like to do is to take some time off closer to having to finish it. So like the holidays was good because then I had five or six days to get this finished. And then early December, I took a week off of vacation. I went to see my mom in Florida. I just... Uh, it, it helped a lot. Like I also had like a five, six days to really get it done properly and then get it released on the internet takes time as well. You're trying to tell everyone it exists. So that's uh, that's also something that needs hours. So I try, I try not to be at work during those times, but the, otherwise like it's not, if I had to choose between the two, like I obviously prioritize work. So on that, having going home for the holidays, let's backtrack. Where are you from? Uh, Montreal, Canada. Where you, do you, how long do you stay in Montreal? Uh, like right now, I'm gonna go back January second to I, LA. 
Oh, I meant in, in from birth on. Like, how long were you? Did you move around? Did you live in Montreal when as a child? I, yes, and then I lived in Toronto uh, after that, and that's where I worked in accounting. And then I've been in LA for two years, so I mostly lived in Montreal and Toronto, and then I've never lived in the U.S. until two years ago. So, um, were um, did you like movies a lot as a kid, or did you like trailers a lot as a kid? <laughs> Um, I, well, I love both. Um, they and don't then, have to be mutually exclusive. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we had a we had a um, a channel in Quebec which was basically MTV, but a Quebec version, so a French Canadian version of MTV, and it was called Music Plus. It was the same thing, but it was just in French. Um, and they did mashups back in the day of really summer movies. Like I remember summer of. Uh, 1994, so now I'm in my 30s, so I grew up in the 90s. Um, summer of 1994, there was Lion King animated, and then Speed, True Lies. It was like a big summer of movies, and they would do mashups to like Hans Zimmer. That is, it was very much like what the things that I'm doing are, and I remember as a kid, I was obsessed with like the Music Plus movie mashup, and they must have done it on these old editing softwares where like, you do a cross dissolve like with a lever or something, but it was really well done. Um, well, how I long were these mashups? They were like about sixty to ninety seconds. It'd be like one segment of the mashup that I do. Because um, well, I they... remember as a kid in, on MTV in America, they they had uh, the MTV Movie Awards and they had some really good mashups too, along those lines too. Yes, I saw that as well. So that's. That's probably where like the French Canadian MTV got the idea from. It's probably the MTV Movie Awards, uh, and they had a great use of music at these award shows. I guess they're still doing the MTV Movie Awards. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I I feel like that's that's one of those other signs. I'm just getting older, where I'm like, oh, that's still happening. That's still a thing. Is Jim like Carrey still getting popcorn? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big paid infomercial <laughs> for like summer movies, but and then I I, I ponder like is. Was it like that as well back in the day where I thought it was awesome and I was just too young to realize that that's what it is? But I, I do remember that they did a great use of songs. They would pair up songs with movies that had nothing to do with the marketing of that movie. They would just, just use a song and use a movie. And then when they showed clips of nominees, you could hear these songs fit with these movies. And it was whoever was in charge of that was very had great creative instincts. I remember that. Um, going back, do you remember your first movie? That I saw in theaters? M maybe just in general. I mean, your first, I want to know what your first theatrical experience is, but if that wasn't your first movie, what, what was your first one? The first movie I saw in theaters was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That and is it was so awesome. cool. That is so cool. Yeah, and it was awesome, but it wasn't really a kid's movie. But it was at the same time, which is why it, it works so well, is because it's like a film noir and it's really heavy, but it's not because if you're a kid, you're not catching anything that's going on. Well, with the I know what just... my, my nieces and nephew, I used to, when they were growing up, I would describe the movie to them and I describe the voice of Judge Doom at the end and just start doing the high squeal part. Remember me, anybody? And like, I would scare them just describing it to them. I just, I just don't know if they would make a film like that anymore because it's, it's such a risk. Because you're taking properties like like Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse show up at some point. You think you're taking all these these IPs that are very protected. Sure. And then you're, you're pairing them up with some <laughs> things that are just like, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't you, know. It was. You just look at something like uh, Ready Player One right now as the example of where their brains are at. If they can do something like that now, that's how creative it'll be for like. I, I mean, I, I like the movie fine, but I remember someone comparing it to like a. Um, family guy episode of ips being shoved in where they just suddenly come up randomly and like whereas who framed roger rabbit is a really coherent great movie unto itself yeah i thought it was uh like it was much more family friendly like ready player one is, is something for all ages and then i guess roger rabbit was sold as such but it's like it's a lot more edgy maybe it's because zemeck is the, the back to the future and then he had a lot of clout with studios he was able to to have you know creative control and then <laughs> but I, I remember that's the first movie i saw in theaters and i was like blown away by how good it was well what were your other big movies growing up it's like i i saw everything in the 90s that everyone wanted to see so like jurassic park independence day and 
And then I would watch the Oscar ones too, even though I was very young. Like I would watch The English Patient and Schindler's List. And like I, I, I tried to find appreciation for every kind of movies, even horror. I watched all the horror when I was too young to watch it. And, um, and then I try to do that in these mashups as well. I try to give every film a chance to shine, even though they have nothing in common or they're just very, very different meant for different audiences that is definitely one of the things that shines with your mashups in particular like the thing i love about them is like um i'm always pushing people to like you know just not distinguish between high art and low art and the way you blend them all together or are are you a big fan of uh, south korean cinema yes the genre mashups you are doing you are perfecting how like these things have more in common than they don't and they don't need to have these uh, arbitrary distinctions between them and have these movies can you know can move from one moment to another just like a good south korean movie just it blends genre so well like these mashups i don't know i i, I was i sometimes i was going through the um going through all of them and i just remember thinking like whenever they're, they're always really inspiring and um you always when you want to um lament about how um uncreative hollywood could be or the film make, or the film industry is like you just have to look at your mashup and you're just like this is human ingenuity on at its highest like this is creativity and these are the things we can achieve like you just it accumulates it all together and so it's so inspiring to watch these mashups well i i really appreciate it um and i agree like i echo everything you say um, uh, there's a lot of criticism about modern filmmaking and I, I've had these arguments, including at work with other editors, <laughs> I've had these arguments about how modern filmmaking is excellent versus, oh, everything they make nowadays is so bad compared to, and I, I compare it to music where I said, um, you know, growing up I had people telling me like, oh, the seventies was like the best music was in the seventies and everything they make now is terrible, everything. and now people are using the 90s they're doing the exact same speech they say like oh in the 90s we had nirvana and smashing pumpkins are so much better than all the crap that's in the radio now and it's the cycle has nothing to do with the creative output it has to do with growing old yeah and the 20, launching the 20 year cycle is so weird whenever and it's always comes around to like who's in charge of not you know what i mean by in charge but who's the person like kind of in the positions of media to say like this is what's good and this is what's bad and it's well, it's repeat we've seen it on cycles now multiple times and it's it's a, just a new version of the get off my lawn phenomenon that's exactly yeah yeah that's exactly what it is and then i in 2040 or in like 2035 there's gonna be some people saying how inception and black swan are masterpieces and um you know, everything that's being made now is crap. <laughs> like, it's like, it's going to be the same thing. There's young people who don't know that in 20 years, they'll be saying that. And they'll be like, like the 2010s was like the decade of creative genius. And now it's like, nothing's good anymore. So it's, it's, it's the human nature of it that makes it happen. And I, I feel like every, every decade has had excellent work and terrible work and, it, it comes like that. The thing is, we forget about all the terrible work. We forget about the 80s movies about learning to drive in drive and hitting on girls and having sunglasses. And like, like there's there's tons of these movies we nobody thinks about. Then they think of Ghostbusters and Back to the Future. And well, the glorious thing about your mashups when I'm watching, like, I was going, th like, besides the fact I love to, like, when I when I can um, contextualize when a movie came out, then I remember where I was at when I saw it and where I was at in my life. And it's amazing how you just you just continually pull out great moments. I don't know if that's the trailer mentality in general, but you pull out these great moments in movies that sometimes may be a chore to sit through for like two hours or so, but they're worth it for this one moment sometimes, or even isolated. Like like sometimes I'd see a see scene and I remember like the context of it. I was like, yeah, that was a great moment in a um, in a mediocre movie. Yeah, well, that, that happens in trailers themselves, for sure. So when you say that it's a trailer mentality, like, basically, like, the filmmaking process is interesting because it's, like, it's constantly trying to up the quality of something in, like, several batches led by several people. So, like, when you go from the dailies to the film itself, that's, you know, you're trying to 
take all this stuff and make something emotional and that feels good and that and then when the trailer person takes your thing and then they try to do that too then i take whatever the trailer person is doing and i'm trying to do that so you just, you just keep condensing and squeezing that orange for like you know more of the juice and then of course sometimes you go back and you'll find a movie that's not that good um like you know i have a lot of examples but um yeah. like personally I, i thought i thought crazy stupid love is didn't really work i didn't think it was a good movie but there was this one moment that it was really cool where um the, uh, the stone stone kiss. Stone. yeah and then it's just it's a good moment and then in the trailer it really, really worked as well the film itself i don't know i, I don't know if it works but um Yeah, I guess I guess it's the nature of trailers as well. You try to get the the best of what's in there and then I try to get the best of what's in trailers. So eventually it, it narrows down to these like this string out of every everything that everyone has to offer that is uh, you know their best uh, their best put forward. I um I uh, worked for like 10 years in a movie theater and I remember finding this phenomenon firsthand where you, you'd see you, at your daily job, you'd see a movie, um, you'd see a mediocre movie that uh, would have a great moment in it and you try to sell it to somebody and they would roll their eyes or just think of like, um, I remember one movie I used to defend that just because it became a scapegoat was Gigli, you know, that movie, uh, Martin Ritt movie with um, uh, yeah. um, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, not Martin Ritt, but um yeah like I just, there's like three or four great moments in that movie and yet that movie became a punching bag because no one was seeing it and i it's not like i, I wanted to like i understood that people have lives and they're not going to like if they hear all these horrible reviews of it they're not going to go see it but i also got in i remember saying like that's not the worst movie that even came out this week like it and so i just remember in particular falling in love with great moments in movies no one else would know and it became like a private thing like you couldn't like you you almost stopped telling people about it just because they'd roll their eyes like i know when i first started pleasantville i, ha I have this such a fond memory it's not in the whole movie itself but there's like two or three moments in that movie and that it's got that great randy newman score where it just swells and it's amazing and it's just like when i watch your mashups that's i, I, I hate to say it it'd be so nostalgic but it feels like i'm back in the theater watching a watching a good moment that no one else is really paying attention to or, or they're treating disposably. Yeah. And I, I think some movies get great moments by building them up for a really long period of time. Um, so you don't have to do that in a matchup. You can go straight to the good stuff and then that's it. Even if it's out of context, it's fine because it's, it's a musical piece. So people are accepting of the fact that you don't need context. You don't need to know who these characters are and you can go straight to it. Um, but it, so yeah, sometimes some movies, they lead to this great scene and then getting there is, is difficult, it's a difficult path, but then it does pay off at, at one point. So, um, it's important to give every movie a fair chance, um, and not, you know, not approach this thing saying, oh, I hated this movie. So I hated Brightburn. So whatever. Right. I'm not going to use it. Like, I'm not going to watch the trailer for it. It's like, it's, it's not really like, um. It's, it's more fun as an end product if you're being very objective and you're giving every movie a, a chance to shine no matter what performance they had at the box office or what kind of reviews they got or even if it was panned or anything. You try to, to remove judgment and say, like, what do you have to offer? And then you'll find an amazing shot in this trailer for a movie that, like, shouldn't have that amazing of a shot, but they do. And then it's the funniest thing ever. You're like... Um, It happened in like Father Figures with Owen Wilson. <laughs> it's, it's like this, like, like this disposable comedy that came out. And uh, there's this one shot where like their car is on a uh, a real world track, and it's like everything is blue, but the the red of the it's like it's the best shot ever. So you take that out of there and you put that in the mashup, and then everyone thinks it's like a a foreign Oscar contender, but it's not. It's Father Figures. Which one was Father Figures? Like, exactly no i mean was that the that's not you had the one of um oh i'm completely thinking of something different i was thinking about that jason sudeikis uh jennifer aniston one for a second but what was father figures what was that uh i think it came out two years ago but if you go in the and watch the trailer for it if you go on hg trailers and you search father figures you watch the trailer you'll see that one shot where like it stands out it feels like a like it's another movie because it's like the film is shot like you know like any comedy that's being done 
on a budget with like very efficiently but then it, for some reason it has this one shot that like does a great job at composition and it's like i don't know um i'm 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 99 sure that that's the film but yeah you should definitely watch the trailer and, and go find that shot i thought it was hilarious okay uh, it, it happens often like it happens sometimes so so i have to watch every trailer and then i have to give everyone a chance and then say like well what what's the best lines you've got what's the best shots you've got and how can this work um, and it's more fun it's it's a lot more fun for people to 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 rediscover or to like discover films that they had never heard of or had heard were to stay away from um, sometimes justifiably but still like it's it's nice to not just make it a tribute for these like four or five films that everyone is is hyped about yeah or especially because like the when, I mean, it's weird how, you know, so much of film criticism is still based in the newspaper format of, like, the daily thing. And, like, you know, if, if uh, newspapers are the first draft of history, it it, it gets so short-sighted, especially when you, as you were talking about earlier, going back to what, the, what people are going to really be talking about in 20 years. We're constantly in this thing of, like, where we were like, why did people hate that movie then? And then we're... And, we don't want to be harsh on it, but we also want to be like, why were you guys celebrating this movie at the time? You know, like why is, uh, oh, I don't know, in the 76 Oscars, Oscars, why did Rocky be Taxi Driver and, um, you know, everything else that, it, that was that that year too? Yeah, I think I think time is uh, is the only the only judge in this in that court of law. Um, I would always give the thing, the John Carpenter's the thing, being panned by critics. Um, because it came on the same summer as E.T. Yeah. It's like, oh, you should go watch E.T. if you want an alien movie that's not going to, like, disappoint you and rip you off. And, like, if you go read, like, the reviews that came out when the thing came out, it was like, <laughs> it was so mean. And it was, like, saying that it, it's an ugly, disposable film. And, and nihilistic. <laughs> yeah. I remember Ebert's review in particular. What's funny is I have a film – or someone who's going to be on the show, a f friend of mine who um, – you know how they they say that um, the thing's the beginning of his, I don't know what they call it, his nihilism trilogy, but his darkness trilogy, where it's the thing, Prince of Darkness, and then the Mouth of Madness. Like, right, right, right. he's a big Carpenter fan, and he, for some reason, has skipped Prince of Darkness and then the Mouth of Madness, which, to be fair, I just saw, like, within the last two years, because I've been trying to get be a completionist on Carpenter, and they're amazing. And, uh, and I, I saw Thing for the first time maybe ten years ago. I didn't see it as a kid. And, and you know... I don't know if it was the reviews that did it or just cumulatively through osmosis where I just didn't make it a priority, but like those, those are my, I mean, Carpenter's made a lot of great movies, but those are up there. Those are definitely up there. Oh yeah. And I, I think it, it took a really long time for people to, to wake up to it. And then there's these other films that are hailed as masterpieces when they come out and then nobody remembers them <laughs> yeah like, i mean gandhi's a good movie but et gandhi like that for that summer but um when i uh when i was watching those um when i was working in the theater i really and as i first started editing too i really became convinced to believe that for the longest time i don't know how i feel now but for the longest time i was thinking that trailers were the best version of american filmmaking just because they were the least constricted by um stage or or narrative um they were more musical but they still conveyed information so fast they could be really emotional but they were also they were more pure form of film than a lot of the feature films you'd watch i mean do you, do you agree with that well I, I think i think they're more condensed um so there's a there's a lot less pressure in keeping the attention span of someone for two minutes and 20 seconds than for, you know, two hours. Um, and because they're condensed, it's like, it would be like um, a fashion magazine that takes 500 pictures of you and then you only get to look at like the best three. That's kind of like that. So it's just like, it's, there's all the stuff that's a struggle about the movie is not present in the trailer. Sure. Well, so I'm, no, I, I'm in particular think like you, I didn't want to say that you can stretch out a trailer's rhythm into a two hour film or I mean, I, I think there's a perverse way to do it. But like um, I just remember just, there's so many movies I got be had a better time at their trailer than I did watching the entire two hour movie, a more fulfilling time sometimes. 
Yeah, I think it's been very like transformative as well. Like I feel in the '90s there were trailers that were cut in a certain way, and that was the way to do it. Especially when Don LaFontaine was the the movie voice oh, guy, right? Like, the inner world guy. Yeah, he was doing like all of them, like in Gotham, and it was like every time you hear his voice, it was like. It was telling you right off the bat, like, this is not made for television. Like, this is a movie that you have to see in theaters. That's why the voices. And they stopped doing that. Obviously, he passed away, but they stopped doing that. And then it became a, a very, like, audio intensive kind of craft. Um, I think the trailer editor's name is Bill Neal. He works at Buddha Jones. He's, he's one of the best, if not the best. And he did this trailer for the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I remember that yes. trailer where they um, didn't they riff on the original trailer though with that um, you had that like shot developing with that like hingy sound to it. Yes, um, and then he he started turning the industry. I mean, not like single handedly. It just be, like a lot of great work was done by a lot of people, but he's pointed out as one of the first who basically uh, I think what he did is like he took a pho- photograph sound effect and he started doing it on repeat and when you repeat the same sound it becomes unsettling uh, because it feels it's just like a machine that's not working um, so it's it was just like that photograph sound that just kept coming back and coming back and back and then um, that trailer became basically what every client would say I want a trailer just like that like I want why don't you guys do like exactly that um, and then it sort of redirected the whole thing and then uh, like Prometheus had a great teaser as well that used the original alien right sound. which I, I always um, when I uh, on two of the movies I worked on I had to work on the trailers and so we always talk about the greatest edit, edit, trailers of all time and it, just almost every list lists the original alien as if not number one, it was usually like the shining or the original alien. And that's probably one of my favorite trailers of all time, the original, but Prometheus trailer is really cool too. Yeah. Well, the, the, I guess the reason why the Prometheus trailer works is because it meant a lot to so many people, that original alien trailer and how, I guess at the, at, it was such an interesting proposition to make a full blown horror film in space, like as a sci-fi and like and then that trailer really sold it so well um like it was kind of uh, it stayed with a lot of people as as the best trailer ever and then i guess prometheus i think wildcard did the prometheus trailer because they knew that and they were like well you know let's just reuse that sound and bring back those feels and then it, it worked in their favor um but yeah i guess i guess a lot of audio um, craft has been added to the to the trailer uh, industry in a way that wasn't done before. There was a very standard way to do it before, back in the day, and then uh, now it's there's a lot more room for creativity. I feel people want something fresh, and they want the you know the the next trend. Well, I, I remember forever the uh, um, Hans Zimmer Bois from Inception, which I don't think was even Hans Zimmer or somebody else working from was the uh, was the uh, trailer trend that everyone seemed to. Which also bled over into some movies too, or into blockbusters as well. Right, right, right. And then uh, they they started doing dark, dark mood covers of famous songs, which I think I think is pretty much oh, done. Uh, that that trend, I'm happy. I I could be I could I could take that trend or leave it, and I think I'd leave it. It's probably, it's probably the Social Network that the, did it the first time with the uh, Creep. Yeah, that uh, that that is a good one, but I mean, I, I, that was like the first one. So like when it was the first one, then it's the same thing. And that's how that's how it really works is um, the clients are looking at everyone's work and then they get excited. So for the social network, that was like Mark Wolin, they they got really excited about it and the film did really well financially. It's a movie about Facebook. So clearly the trailer did its job and they started using the social network trailer and saying, like, can we do exactly like this? Can you just like, you know, I love how they use Radiohead, but then it was like a a chorus of children can you do that with this song and then it's cool for a little while but then it gets you know <laughs> it's like it's a it's a product life cycle well let's that... backtrack again um so you um edit under the handle sleepy skunk um i guess the story was you would fall asleep in movies uh no i i created a character like a sort of a car cartoon character 
for like two reasons. When I worked in an accounting firm, uh, it was Ernst & Young in Toronto, it, it wasn't regarded as a positive thing to have a hobby that consumes your time a lot. Okay. So it was it was sort of Hence the you don't want to Yeah, you don't want to be known as someone who's, you know, working at the firm and who's also oh, but I like I'm a DJ, at, you know, at raves and I'm really good at it and that's my passion. Like you didn't want that. So it's like I I'm like I'm going to create this character and that'll be me online so that there's no blending the two um, and then I figured if I wanted to pass it on to someone, if people know you as an editor, but it's your name, when you stop, then it's not you anymore. But then if it's this character, then the character can be, can be borrowed or, um, can live on like, um, so that's kind of fun that the property is, is detached from me and that a lot of people know of it online. Um, it's, yeah, that's the only reason. I mean, why is it sleepy skunk? as a character, I guess a lot of internet nicknames are like animals that were <laughs> like, like it was kind of a thing where like, there's, there's no real reasoning behind it. It was kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a classic internet handle of something kind of a little ridiculous. And then I grew from that handle to this, you know, character that this guy animates, who's a freelancer. And then he does these Nintendo graphics with it which he's great. Um, so that's not you. That's, a, that's someone else contributing to that. Yeah. 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 He's uh, he, his name is John Stratton. He does, he does these trailers that are like eight bit Nintendo games. If a certain recent film had come out in the eighties and Nintendo eight bit Nintendo did the version, the game version of that movie. I've seen so, scenes of that. I've ever seen the last Jedi version of that uh, big scenes in the last Jedi with a done as the eight bit Nintendo. Um, yeah. He does he does it really well. Like he's able to, I don't know how he does it actually. Like, like the, the pixelating makes sense to me, but how he's able to get the soundtracks sound like old Nintendo is, it's pretty cool. So I asked him to, to do like these, these epilogues, like these little things to make announcements. So it wasn't, you started out, it wasn't just end of the year mashups you were doing. I mean, one of your first ones was the, um, you put everything that they put into the amazing Spider-Man trailer into one full sequence. So you can almost get the sense of the plot. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, that was a one-time thing. Um, and it was, it was kind of an uncertain project because I, I didn't know how much marketing was out there. So I was like, let's just gather up everything they put and then see how long it ends up being and how much of a movie it feels. Um, cause it was a joke at the time. Like people were making jokes online about like they've released so much of this movie that like, it feels like I've seen the entire film. Um, and this would yeah, include then, like deleted scenes and reshot stuff. Yeah, I think I think the problem that they had that Sony had on Spider Man is they they have I mean they're they're very much the definition of an international conglomerate company. Um, so they have like Sony India, Sony obviously Japan is the head office. Like they have all these teams that don't talk to each other that are in charge of marketing their properties inside each country. And then the Amazing Spider-Man had this multicultural cast, including Irfan Khan, I think the actor's name is, who's huge in his own country. So they released all the scenes with him on Sony Pictures India on YouTube. But it's out there for everyone. So it's like, I think they just didn't realize how much they put out there. And they were very insecure because they were between the Avengers and the Dark Knight Rises, which were tracking way higher for good reason. So I think they just got nervous about their tracking versus these other two competing films. And then they just, they released too much. So it was fun. It was like, let's just put it together. And then it ended up being like a half an hour episode of a sitcom, but it's like, it's, it's the whole movie from beginning to end. I mean, that, I mean, it's just a, such a great meta uh, critique of the, um, what ends up happening. I'm not sure it's not what the intentions are the trailer houses or the marketing team, but like that's, that, that much movie got given away for a movie that kind of doesn't work. Yeah. You know? Um, so how, so what was the journey then from doing the, uh, mashup or that mashup to the end of year mashups to going to LA? Uh, well, the end of year mashup, I started in 2010, very, like in a very humble way on final cut express. And it was the first time I ever edited something. It was like, 
let's try to do it you know, Final Cut Express. I, I'm, I'm giving you expressions of Final Cut Express, uh, TV on the radio, but wow, okay. okay. Humble, humble beginnings. Humble beginnings. But I mean, it's good in a way because... I learned on uh, the very, very original uh, premiere when uh, probably like 2003, 2004, and I still have a fond spot for that, even with current premiere being as good as it is. Yeah, if you don't know anything about editing, I was going to say, like, it's just, you have to start somewhere comprehensive and, like, you know, Avid is not going to get it easy for you to, like, to get to do what you want. Like, you have to start with the the basics. And then Final Cut Express, it's not iMovie. It's, it was better than iMovie. It did allow for, like, all the export options that you needed and all the sound tweaks and the... So it was very basic, and I guess I still have that video, 2010 movie trailer. I, I just watched it, yeah. And I mean, that was the first time I ever tried to put something together, and then it got a good response. So I was like, I'll do it again next year. And then, um, so I guess that started before, um, before anything. And then in 2013, I heard from someone who's running a trailer house who sent me an email and said, basically, if you ever want to move to LA, I'd be willing to hire you. Because I, I watch your stuff every year and I think I think you have something that is not trainable and I think everything that you don't have is trainable, so we'd be willing to train you. What kind to, of stuff was was uh, did they train you on? a uh, ton of stuff. I mean there's just there there's two things. There's two like huge learning curves. There's the technical nature of everything, especially in finishing and in exporting importing as well like you have to work at a pace where you need to understand how everything works and you know where are those files what format am i putting these files in how do i do this 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 and that and you're working with people who are extremely experienced so they don't have that much time on their hands like people who work in finishing are always on huge deadlines so so, so just learn are, are you technic- are you doing like i guess uh like I know I have to make this distinction between assistant editing and editing just because a lot of this, like, I don't know. Like, I'm always, when I'm, I go onto a movie, I'm always like, can you, are you hiring an assistant editor? Is they Are they going to figure this out? Because the format stuff is, it's so trying. And it's something you have to keep up to speed with. Like, because the technology keeps updating, too. Like, no, I was really lucky to work with assistant editors. They were very patient with me and they were very nice. And they, they, they explained everything to me. And then eventually you run out of things you don't know. That's the best way to put it. It's like eventually you've figured it all out and all your files are in the right formats, in the right place, in the right everything. Um, so I guess, yeah, if you're doing it from a laptop for fun and you put it up on YouTube, you're not part of this machine that operates in a, in a, in a certain way. Like the, the confidentiality of the, the files that are being shown as well. Um, like you don't have any of that when you're just working from a laptop. So I had to learn the technical and then, um, also an understanding of what the client is looking for. Cause when you're doing your own mashups and stuff, you're just, you, you have full creative control and you can try crazy things. And, but eventually it has to be a, a it has to be a half and half between your own creativity and your own ability to shine and, uh, distinguish yourself, but also understanding what the client likes. There's a certain way of cutting and there's a certain type of content that leads to them wanting to go ahead and, and use your content. So you have to learn all of that. And then that, that works a lot with producers. That's a producer's job is to, is to understand exactly what the client wants so that we're sending that to them. And then, yeah, I mean that's well. My it's, next it's, question was going to be what what is like what your experience is dealing with clients, but you've already uh, answered that. Um, well, I mean, does then your own mashups not having to answer to anybody does that give you your little shine of creativity at the end of the year where you don't you can do stuff on your own and not have to answer to anybody? Yeah, that's good. Um, I I mean, it's not like I wouldn't say it's like therapeutic, but it's they balance it's a, each other out at least. Yeah, I think. It, I think it's fun to also not have any direction. Like I go into these not knowing what the end product is going to be like, but you can't really do that on a professional project. You have to map out, this is where we're going. This is where this needs to feel like this. And then you cut it. These mashups, I, I 
it's this very messy process and I kind of like it. Like I'm in, I'm in my own mess of, you know, there's clips everywhere and there's like, so I guess it's a very unstructured creative process, which leads to things that I don't have to justify myself. I just put it out there and then, you know, enjoy. Um, when you work professionally, I think you need to have a clear agreed plan on where this is going ahead of time and then you need to, to do it exactly a certain way once that's been decided between a lot of people so uh yeah it's nice it's a nice it's a nice relief once a year to just do something and have a final say for sure someone had tried to tell me that it worked at some trailer houses that a lot of the strategy with the studio sometimes were to uh send the, have five houses do it and then combine the things they like from each house is that is that inaccurate uh, no, that's, that's, that happens sometimes. Um, I mean, yeah, so, or sometimes the, the front end of a trailer works really well. And that was met, made by someone. It can be within the same house, like two different editors. The front end works really, really well, but the back end of another editor's trailer works really well. So they're just going to delete half of each trailer and just match them together. Because it's from the same source material, so sometimes you don't lose any of the storytelling logic. It's just someone does a better job at setting up the plot and explaining this is what this movie's about, and then someone does a better job at making you feel like you want to see it. Um, and then that happens a lot. It's a it's a very revisions heavy process, and the the process works in the end. Like it works better than if one person is left to, you know just like directors i mean sure. it's not always true with directors but it's like sometimes uh, someone was talking about margaret margaret the film the Kevin monogram movie right right and he wanted it to be three hours long and the studio was like like it's too long like it's so slow and it takes for so they were like if you're gonna if we're gonna release it it has to be under two hours and then he said no you're not gonna release my movie. And they were gone, and there's there's still a lawsuit or litigation for that. They they released the um, the full cut, and the full cut is significantly better. Uh, although the the shorter one, it, the shorter one's good. It's just it almost is like there was a pa You get to see in certain parts late in the movie the passive aggressive fight between the distributor and and the director, where like uh, you see the beginning of a scene. There's an arbitrary uh, exterior shot of the New York skyline, and then you see a truncated version of the end of the scene. Like they just arbitrary just yeah. cut to an exterior just to get through it. It's, um, and so the director's cut doesn't have that, but obviously he's trying to work with a longer rhythm and a longer movie. But um, uh, so wait, on trailers, how fast do you guys typically have? Two weeks. Like usually, usually we have two weeks. We oh. like to have a first a first draft. Okay. And then if, if you're cutting TV spots and you know digital spots, it's going to be more like two to three days, or maybe. And then this would be a team of like two or three guys that are working uh, on their own, and then seeing what each person comes up with creatively. Yeah, I think I think you work on your own, and then you're just upping the quality internally until you, everybody feels it's ready to go to client. Are you typically working from then the finished product, or do you get dailies sometimes? Um, mostly finished products usually comes in when they're, when they're ready to, to work a trailer, usually they're, they're able to send us something, but, um, it happens sometimes where it's, especially animated films, you're going to have a finished product, but it's like all the, all the clips are going to be very, um, unfinished. Oh, um, so, so you have like animatics and stills and things like that. Yeah. It, it can be very difficult to, uh, to, to realize how good the film is because it doesn't have the animation completed. Um, it just has these, these drawings and everything. So, um, so you are the guest on the, uh, the final episode of 2019. And I've talked to a bunch of people that tend to agree with me that um, I, or my friend phrased it this way. It's not exactly uh, 1999, but this has been a really good year for film. Um, do you feel that way? Yeah, yeah, I think, well, actually, I did a decade mashup, so I I had some years that had a lot more to offer than others when I was doing that, <laughs> and the, the best ones were 2010, 2013, 2015, and 2019. Those, like, huh. I could put a mashup out of just those, and then the other ones were like, oof, like, 
And the other ones, I was trying to fit some stuff in. I was like, man, that that wasn't. But every every year has their great films and their their bad films. Um, but yeah, 2019, it was. Uh, I still haven't put my top ten together yet, but I think I know what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was it was a pretty awesome year. You, I mean, can you name some what you what you were thinking uh, in your top ten or just the movies you liked a lot this year? Why well, my number one is the same number one as everyone I know, which is Parasite. I think I, back to I, I think, South Korean filmmaking. Yeah, I think some people are are starting to make the argument that it could win Best Picture because for some reason it's just everyone's number one. I, um, I, because. I, I, I don't really I haven't I don't talking to people in LA recently so that's amazing if that's what the what the vibe is going on out there well it's because eventually it's a preferential ballot so sure eventually it's not the best picture it's the most liked picture if that makes sense um, and then no one says that they don't really like or love parasite and everyone's coming out with their lists right now and they're like yeah parasite is number one sometimes number two or number three if someone really got emotional about another movie which is never the same everyone has a different number one when parasite's number two but i mean the big challenge is that foreign language and the oscars just the oscar voters they don't like foreign language uh, they, they never last emperor would be the last best picture uh non-english movie that's not right there's gotta be something yeah. in between there or the the artist technically, I guess. But the artist was like silent, right? It was. But it, it had it the just... one line at the end. I can't remember if the line was in English or not. Mm, that's a good. That's a good question. Yeah. It was anyway. It, it was like Tom and Jerry, uh, which you can show like in classrooms in Asia, or like because there's just no talking, so it's just everything was uh, acted out as a. Um, Iconographic. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I thought. Yeah, I thought Roma had a really good shot at best picture but that that always comes back like oscar voters don't want to read subtitles <laughs> I, I you know there's a part of me that like obviously you're limiting yourself but there's a part of me that wants to just on a um, aesthetic level like if a filmmaker works so hard to direct your eye to have to constantly um look down at the bottom of the screen and also just the differences between the literary part of your brain versus the visual part of your brain, which, I mean, yes, there's a lot of overlap between the two since when you're reading, it's a visual thing, but your brain just is working different. So sometimes you're having to think different. I, I'm always impressed with people when they mess around with subtitles and do stuff with animated subtitles. That's always, uh, like those Nightwatch movies did some really creative stuff with it. I was always impressed with that. Um, so uh, I guess my last question is, you so much of good editing and I imagine trailer editing is trial and error. What does a bad mashup look like? Uh, it's really hard to do a bad mashup unless you're you're not very good at choosing what's what scenes are good. Like if you go get the best shots and the best moments out of all the films from the decade, and you just drop them on a timeline, like a, like on your you, you just drop them on premiere in a random order you put a song under like it would still be good because it's like yeah the curation part of it is is what matters the most in the end it's like but the curation part's the part of the creativity i mean you i mean it's it's weird that like you have to tell like people who don't understand editing understand that like um picking the shots really is and like it, it, this isn't i mean the dp shot it but you know when you, when you organize it well enough that's what makes it look as spectacular as it does and and i mean just i, I think that's one thing you have a particular eye for just because like if there's these you just keep finding these dynamic shots that just were just you put them together i mean it's yeah it's it, yeah the, the, i i am a fan i'm a fan of your mashups yeah well i i appreciate it uh i think um I think the process that works the best for everyone that has done these types of videos and for myself is you're going to put a shot that's based on what you're looking for and you'll leave it there and then you'll replace it with another shot over it uh, on your timeline. And then eventually the shot might get replaced and might go away. Like you could have someone who looks like they're crying, but there's another shot of someone crying from another film and it, it just fits better. It feels better with the music. It connects better. So it's like the trial and error is to try these visual and pile them up until you decide which one 
is the best. And that's also how I get to miss out on some movies. Like some people were complaining that Rocket Man was not in the 2019 mashup, but it was for like almost the whole time that I edited it. But in the end, I found this scene from Booksmart that works so much better where Rocket Man was, and then I had to upload. <laughs> so it's like at the last minute, it got kicked off. But I replaced it because I was looking. I'm looking for the visual moment more than I'm looking to make a comprehensive. Like these are all the films that came out. I don't care about that as much as watching something that just makes you feel something. Like it makes you feel good. Yeah, that that, that totally makes sense from a realism standpoint. Louis Plamondon, thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you so much.